Hello, everybody. Now I can see you. Fantastic. Um, Ellis, do you want to? Yeah, let's just get to, uh, apologies, everyone, for the slight delay in starting. Um, but um, frankly, uh, it's of our receiver, so uh, we don't mind. Um, what a thrill. Um, this is um, a kind of session we've been trying to put together for a little while. It's the latest of a series of conversations that Bruno Sylvester has been having with Alvaro over the years. Um, previously, um, I think with students at the University of Kingston for the Register podcast and also the Izzy Metstein um, lecture in Edinburgh a few years ago. But the, the focus tonight is really going to be about um, Alvaro's, Alvaro's interest in um, art and sculpture and ultimately also criticism, kind of looking at the margins of his practice and how these other disciplines have, have informed the work that he makes as an architect. Um, Bruno, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good evening to uh, everyone in the room. There's a about um, 200 people from all around the world. Uh, thank you, Alvaro Cesar, for um, joining us tonight and, and participating in this program. Uh, and thank you to Alice Woodman and the Architecture Foundation for inviting us and organizing this um, wonderful program of the 100 Day Studio. Um, Cesar, since we agreed that this was not a lecture, that you were not going to be talking about your work, uh, I thought that um, we didn't talk about your work, but we talk about the way that you work, uh, because your work is, is out there for everyone to see. And um, I was thinking that we could talk about matters uh, that are at the margins of your architectural practice. And I had two themes in mind. One was um, criticism and what people write about your work. And the other one was um, art. And um, I put together a few images to help us with a, with a conversation. And I'm going to put the first one up. And then I, uh, the <laughs> <laughs> they are there. Yeah. So the, the, first one, the first one is, is these. And the reason um, I think I want to explore um, issues relating to art is that when you present and talk about your own work, um, you explain your work in a very logical, practical and pragmatic way as if every single move that you make, even the most eccentric one, like the flying ramps at the Iberia Camargo Foundation, every single move that you make derives from a practical issue. But then if we look at your work with steady concentration, there is a profoundly artistic sense, not only in your work, but in the way that you work. Um, so let's start with art. Is this artistic sense because you want it to be a sculpture? And, and here is an image uh, of a story that you tell that starts, I think, in a trip when you were about 15 years old to Barcelona. So can you tell us a little bit about the impact of this encounter with Gaudi? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I must say that my English is difficult <laughs> and uh, e even to understand things sometimes. For that reason, I, I brought my colleague Maneves, Oh. That, that speaks very well English to help me if I am <laughs> with problems. Uh, about Gaudi, uh, I visited in a vacation travel with my father, my parents, and with my brothers. Uh, every year we would go to Spain, not far. I only went out of Spain, out of Iberia, when I was 40. Because uh, in that time, there was no bush in the schools. Uh, even the situation in Portugal was that of a very closed country. So it was difficult to, to travel. 
also economically. So uh, our travels went to Spain easier. And one of these travels, each year, the family would go in a, a motor car, a rent motor car, big American motor car, uh, making great success in uh, Spain because Spain was then very, very poor. And for instance, didn't exist American motor cars. Then when we arrived, we seen the rich people coming <laughs> to, to Spain. Uh, but it was very beautiful, very poor. Except Madrid and Barcelona, the other towns, we could see the marks, uh, the influence of the civil war that I had finished not much before. So I'm speaking of maybe 45 or 46, just after the end of the war. And for us to go in vacation uh, in Spain was, was very good and also very cheap because in that time, uh, one uh, scudo very much more than a peseta. So we could make very good vacations uh, by the cost of the medium vacation in Portugal. There was a big difference. And the, the, the year we went to Barcelona, I was not at all interested in architecture, absolutely nothing. But my father had problems with uh, my wish to follow sculpture. Uh, the idea then was that uh, sculpture was uh, not good life, bohemian life, not enough money, or this was the idea. So I decided to inscribe in Bozart School, uh, but in architecture, which was then more respectable, a little more, not much. Uh, and uh, with the idea to change step by step without conflicts to architecture. But it happened that after one year or so, by special reasons, which I can explain, I became impatient with architecture. And so I forgot sculpture and began interested really and uh, fighting against my absolute ignorance about, about architecture. And the, the first interest that I remember of architecture was when my father showed us photos of the, the where we are going, he liked much to prepare these tables and would tell us we go this, this, and this. And when I saw first time some photos of uh, the buildings of uh, Gaudi, I was interested and I said, this is sculpture. So I am really interested. In the end, the, the, the tribunes, I would go only to museums, to see monuments and so. Then I was interested. So when I arrived with my older brother, I went, my parents remained in the hotel and I went to see the cathedral. And it was a little frightening, but in this context and the poorness, Barcelona also in the, it was dark in the night and no people in the streets. And suddenly to, we arrived in front of these impressive buildings and it was real frightening. So we turned and we went to the hotel. The next day we could see the Batlon house and Mila and we could enter in the patio and so on. And then I, I was much, much interested uh, with that sculpture. But then we could enter one of the apartments. We got authorization 
and I began seeing that everything that made that apartment was exactly, not exactly, but in a way the same that I had in my old house in, in Matuzinhos in Portugal. I mean, the, the locks, the next dish or the beige. Curtains. Huh? Curtains. Yes, every, all the elements I could see, the windows, it was the same. Eh? Only that uh, same that I, I had in my house. All these elements were thinking together, singing to, together. So there was a, a kind of music coming for the same humble elements I had in my house. And that was the first uh, meeting with architecture that became a part of my mind. Mila, the house Mila. And then when, when did you then become aware, when did you first um, look at the work of um, Le Corbusier? Le Corbusier, uh, I must say that in that uh, political and cultural context in Portugal, then when I entered the school, uh, there was, this is already after the war, so the regime had to open a little, not much, but enough to live in that time where there was not the support of uh, Nazism, Fascism, and so on. Uh, so there was a small opening. And uh, in the school entered a new staff of professors, young people that were in that context fighting for modernity, which was something far from the ambience, also in school. There was a new director, very intelligent man, professor, you knew perhaps Carlos Ramos, uh, informed he was uh, a Bauhaus young, and uh, he brought new element, new ambience to school because he could invite new professors because the, the existing ones were already old, so in the age of reform. So he could invite. In that time, he was not obliged to make uh, competitions. He could choose. And happy me, he, he, he knew to choose very well. And this new generation transformed completely the, the school. But when I entered, modernity was Corbusier. I must say that in school there was no library. <coughs> the information uh, arrived, very few information. Uh, in general, not only in architecture, and uh, uh, magazines only arrived always as uh, do Jovi. So in my, the first time this professor, like uh, that became director, looked, was my professor of uh, architecture projects, looked to my work, <coughs> he made this usually took a cigarette. In that time, we could smoke in the, in the school, pushed, made a cigarette, then used to take a small soda. Skisser. From here, back, back, cut, back. And on, then you began, begin the, the critic to the work. And to me, he said, I will not make a critic for your work. I'm looking and it's clear that you have not the slightest idea of what is architecture. So uh, what my, my advice is go to a bookshop 
and buy some magazines of architecture. And so I did, and uh, I, I was lucky because in the bookshop, there was the last numbers of Architecture de Jouvi were Alvarado, Neutra, and Gropius, and one about hospitals. That when I opened and I saw these big buildings, I was frightened that I immediately closed it. But uh, with Gropius, I had already some information through the, the, the director, the professor. But Neutra, I, I did not know. And Alvarado, I did not know. And uh, I must say that in that time, even few professors were interested in Alvarado. And I, I had an interior crisis when I showed the magazine enthusiastic and everybody said, ah, no, that, it was really Le Corbusier. Uh, and I thought another gaff. I, I said I, li I love this architecture and apparently is not good. <laughs> uh, it took some time and also all the others because my colleagues some had in family an architect or in friends, so they they knew something about architecture. The director would, would not tell them what he told to me, uh, and uh, I was lucky in that case to be ignorant, because because I had not that fixation only in Le Corbusier, and. Uh, I discovered suddenly other ones. I discovered that architecture was extensive. Well, well I, must, I must say, if there are if there are any students here with us, um, if at second year uh, a professor tells you that you know nothing about architecture, uh, it means that you can be a great architect in the future. Um, Cesar, I was, I was going to, I'm going to come back to this because um, then uh, it, it was only Le Corbusier, you discovered other architects, of course, Alvar Aalto was a very important uh, reference at the beginning of your career. Uh, but since, since then, throughout the years, you've been, um, you know, returning to Villa Savoie and visiting um, a lot of work by Le Corbusier and also writing some really passionate essays, the Villa Savoie Revisited, something you wrote in 1987. Um, but Le Corbusier was, uh, before being an architect, he was actually an artist, a painter. And, and how do you understand the relationship between his artistic practice and um, his uh, making of architecture and buildings? Is, is there a relationship between there that you can, that we can learn from? Um, or that you learn from? In my mind, it's the same family. Not only painting, painting and uh, sculpture, but also music, ballet, cinema, uh, and I don't know, literature, poetry. So these are things in the same, of same family can say. And there is a, even today a preconcept or an idea of creating borders. Painting is painting, sculpture is sculpture, music is music. And this is a latent in much of activity in architecture today, specialization. And uh, uh, I remember that recently one of the new ideas for architecture or obligations for architecture, one was that coordination of projects must be, and there is legislation for that, uh, coordination must, must be an element of team, obligatory, 
engineer specialized in coordination or someone specialized in this intense way or objective cannot be a, a coordinator. It's the opposite of the mind of a coordinator. Uh, but this exists much. Then Corbusier was in the same field, let's say, painting or making sculpture or making architecture and looking for his work, you can see the influences, the, the, the whole that is all these activities. It's enough to look to the drawings of the sacred coast in India and uh, some reflection of it in profile of some buildings. So you would uh, make drawings of plants, of uh, uh, animals, landscapes. That was also material for architecture as also the sculptures and painters make. I remember to see the, the drawings of Henri Moore about the vegetation. And so, so these things are, are complementary. And for Corbusier, it's very clear that when he worked, I think he worked, I, I heard or I read, in the morning, in painting and uh, sculpture, and uh, then in the afternoon, going to the to the studio and working in architecture. And there is a zigzag between one and the other activity. Is is there the is there the same in your work, in your experience, in the way that? Um, you work is that that interchange between things that you do outside projects and things that you do inside projects the difference you mean now if if you if you experience if you experience the same interaction between you know the work that you do um as a, as a sculpture because you've done some sculptures and the work that you do as an architect i suppose you cannot separate both yeah of course, when, when uh, as I was uh, mentioning, with this new mind and these new uh, teachers, there was an uh, increasing of information. So in, I don't know, one year, two years, uh, the, the concentration in Corbusier as the modern, with a very good effect, of course, but only restricted change because information began coming. And after the war, there was an increasing uh, communication contacts. So magazines from Italy, magazine neorealism was so influent in this transformation in Portugal, the program in England, of uh, schools. Uh, Tavra, one of professors that you know, a great professor, uh, he went to the Expo in London and then brought all the information of that. Arrived an uh, English magazine. Then in short time uh, came to Portugal Japanese magazine. Uh, and of course, French uh, and, and so and, uh, all the, in all times there has been. Because in Portugal, information is rather uh, developed in the 30s. But the new regime cut the relation that existed. Portugal is a uh, European country. And there were people going to Belgium, to France, to Italy. Italy was very influent, modern in, in Italy. But then the regime cut this, and absolutely for different reasons. And uh, 
things became close. But uh, I will say, in a short time, there was a, an opening. And so we finished doing copies because we received this and this and this, and how in the lower minds, and became so, so vast that uh, the influence we began having in our work were not evident mm -hmm. because they were not the result of a, a vol voluntary use. But they, they would come from the subconscious. We, can, we could not dominate so much information, but it was here. So when needed, it comes. And sometimes uh, it happens to me, some critic or some friend uh, point the influence of that in this work. And I never worked in that influence, but I know it was here. So it becomes a part of ourselves and not a Bible to consult and apply. And in the end, that is the, the education of an architect. Today, the students when enter the school, they have through internet and these things, <laughs> they have a lot of information. So the beginning of uh, uh, life, professional life of, of architect is not uh, limited already to what was important in school, in professors and so, but it is much, has enlarged. And also, uh, began uh, be becoming normal. The travel, the possibilities of looking to architecture, not only through photos, but to live it, which is a new thing for the men. For the men. Um, I'm going to show you another image. Um, I suppose you know what they are looking at. Um, this is Pablo Picasso with Le Corbusier looking at the um, concrete frame of um, the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. And, and, and here is a point where um, modern art and, and modern architecture kind of um, come together through the uh, companionship of these two characters. Um, how do you how do you describe um, the the these interchange between uh, modern art and the outbreak of cubism in early uh, uh, early twentieth century, and then this relationship with modern architecture and the and the quest for new forms of space uh, that that is happening in parallel. Mm. What have you learned from these two? Uh, gentleman in the picture. Yeah, Picasso and uh, Corbusier. Uh, I read, I don't know where, that uh, Picasso was very nervous uh, when he was together with that incredible personality of Picasso. Even if he was also an incredible influence, uh, and it was, uh, I like very much the paintings and uh, still more the sculpture. But uh, of course, it's not Picasso, it's not the explosion of creativity of Picasso. In Madrid, someone made a, a, a bad thing to, to Corbusier in the museum, Santa Sofia. But they put there the Guernica went to Santa Sofia, not very well, I think, the place where they put and how they put it. Reino Sofia. And then, immediately, two or three uh, external studies of Corbusier made like a, a Vulcan book, make it, and then one, painting of Corbusier. 
and it, it was not fair because side by side with studies for Guernica with a dramatic explosion, Corbusier uh, did not uh, uh, sustain, disappeared in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, even it has uh, another type of qualities, but side by side with that uh, explosion was not good for him. For me. Uh, and uh, Corbusier was deeply interested uh, also as much as I know or read or, or heard, he had problems not to be recognized with a, a great painter or a great sculpture. Uh, he had, a, there is a letter he wrote to a friend when he got to make a, an exhibition in Zwick of sculpture. Enthusiastic completely enthusiastic, uh, he wrote, look, Corbusier in the center of the world with his sculptures. So he had a, a complex not to be recognized. Not to be recognized for me was good because years ago, already many years ago, I could buy uh, one or two um, etchings, etchings by the Corbusier in Paris, because the cost was already uh, was accessible to me. Then someone organized a big exhibition in uh, Geneva, I think, and suddenly the cost of everything. So appeared a lot, of, a lot of them, because he offered or sold. There is a great collection, a lady in Switzerland that bought a lot of things. And then when other people, when the cost went up, began putting in uh, in Paris, mainly in Paris, to to sell. So I had this this beginning. So satisfying, but then I, when I went to Paris, I was to the same place, and already, oh, it would be good, but the coast was already up and the up. Uh, wonderful. We might move on. I'm going to show you another another image. Um, this is a project that you didn't build, but I think it has a wonderful story behind it that you could tell us. Um, and um, I suppose, you know, I was thinking that we could talk about the stairs of the Laurentiana Library, but then um, then I thought that I could bring this project uh, up for us to speak about the Castello Sforzesco, the, the Pietà Rondanini, uh, which is something that you uh, proposed, uh, I think, in 1999. And, and your project was um very very restrained it was just a, a piece of floor on the floor inset on the floor and the position of the sculpture in the room and then what happened this this was one of the disgusts in the career but i, I had a compensation a very strong compensation because it was a competition we were five and uh, I won the, the, the competition. So I began working and I had the privilege to be one afternoon, one entire uh, day, afternoon, alone in a museum with the Pietà, because the was the day the museum closed, then that they allowed me uh, to go there. I saw the Pietà as it was. One thing very um, noticeable was that it was put against the wall. There was a kind of panel with surrounding like this. And so we could not see 
the back. The back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as I was alone, I could go in acrobacy and look the, the back. And it was the most extraordinary thing I ever saw. Because, as you know, Corbusier, someone offered him a big marble piece. Michelangelo. He was already 80, or almost 80, in the end of his career, and gave to, to take home to amuse when he was not working or painting uh, a ceiling. And uh, he began a pieta, and we see parts of the pieta he began making uh, with the, the, the pure elements, this arm, this arm, for instance, with all the anatomy in perfect living with the, the veins, veins they look at the fantastic with polished marble, wonderful. But we don't know why. Uh, he, he, he got not happy and in fury. We, nobody knows exactly what provoked it, but probably the idea of death not far already. He destroyed it. And uh, he had uh, the Virgin, uh, more or less uh, as the, the Pietà in Rome. The Christ was, I think, on the, the Pegler. Yeah, on the yeah. Was, yeah. It was sitting on it. And, uh, And uh, we could say uh, conventional in the in the in the way that he had made already to Pietà, at least like that. So we had a fury, and uh, with the the, the, the the marble broken and uh, connecting also, he put uh, the head of Virgin against the head of Christ. And uh, he destroyed the, the, the perfect arms and legs and he made, he began making it. And in the, in the back, there are furious uh, movements of the, the... Strike, stroke. The, yeah. So we could see that in Furia, <laughs> and was very, Tushku. Uh, not worked uh, intensely, not polished and so. Unfinished. But in the middle of that uh, feeling of brutal mo movements, we could see everything as in the perfect part of sculpture. You could see the muscles, the veins, and everything, but made like this. And, and so I thought that it was fundamental to put in the middle of the room, not against the wall, so that people could go around uh, and see how appears a masterpiece uh, made with intensity and with motion, fury, even, and so. Uh, this was not... Uh, accepted by some because the, these images usually were put against the wall. But uh, this is more than a, a normal sculpture in a church. This is a kind of miracle that is uh, Born, being born. Morning, being born. So, these hours I could spend there. I made them around the different drawings of the, the Pietà. 
and I, I thought what to do because the competition was to find a place for the, the Pieta as when it was was bad for the, the groups that, that began coming many many Japanese 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 so they need space so I proposed one entire room only for the Pieta and there is the sculpture that position not exactly in the center but free from the walls and also something that happened because the knowledge of this sculpture that was in some private person is rather recent and then appeared one head perfect and so that is understood as being the original head of Christ that was destroyed when this transformation happened and also the bronze mask of death of uh, uh, Michelangelo Bet. Mm -hmm. so those are in the walls. And uh, there is a parkour there. And we also studied <coughs> the light. There was no lamp, lamp inside. There is two big windows in two faces of the, in two of the walls. So the light that uh, uh, we studied with Castiglione uh, <coughs> was projectors that were outside the room and through the windows, uh, uh, indirect light coming on the, on the sculpture. So I liked very much. And then the director, I, I won a competition, the director of museum <coughs> asked me to study one part you and I understood they wanted me to go on through the museum but then there was a reaction in, uh, in the project was defended by two sculptures but from architecture son defended it but uh, the school of architecture I think because it was a, a delicate moment as uh, <coughs> the, the Rennes Museum was projected by BBPF and some of one of them was professor in school and so there was, um, it became impossible. Uh, it became, it was cancelled. So from the really one day with the Pieta with Michelangelo is enough. So the the birth of a sculpture um, leads us to our next image, um, which on the left is the architect being a sculpture, and on the right, um, I suppose it's the same thing. But here, um, so there is. Uh, uh, a human figure laying on the floor on the left and on the right, uh, not dissimilar to what you were saying about Michelangelo, there is uh, the birth of a column. Uh, so when you were, so there's two questions because there's two images, but when you were um, involved by the Royal the Academy the to do with Eduardo, you can, <laughs> Okay. And uh, smoke um, with these um, four elements. So, can, can you describe the process um, of this intervention at the Royal Academy? Uh, it was a, an um, exhibition in all the the, <coughs> the palace museum uh, with invitation of many artists also was invited so to move uh, so they invited to, to, to architects for this exhibition and so tomorrow made inside an installation and for me they asked me to make something in installation in the patio and uh, i was there 
sur surrounded by all these columns. That, 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 that. So the idea of column was uh, a very immediate idea for me. I didn't know what to do, but I thought I can make here one isolated uh, column, or then the evolution was to a kind of construction or destruction of a column with one piece in the ground and the capital uh, inter uh, simplification of a capital uh, at, at uh, the same place and then how the column was put up this element of architecture and here with the capital already this was the idea uh, they were made in concrete in portugal brought here and some portuguese workers that put it up and uh, well this is all gray gray gris gris gray 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 uh, <coughs> there is no color here and i i i thought it was not enough to isolate this vertical and horizontal three elements <coughs> but i needed uh, to some color in it but i did not know what and i am not <coughs> The theme of color for me, well, better not to smoke. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I'm not uh, to have all that next year. That is. Unless we do the color, so what color and so on. And one morning, in the, in, in the end of the, the visit, I make one visit. Then this was built in Portugal. And I asked for all the measures, how high this did, a relief of this. And I, I sat there, and then there is a coffee, and there are some places in the, in the, under the, these, these columns. I was there taking a tea, and the, in front is the big door of the court, opening to the state. And the state there, much movement, motor cars, uh, people, and everything. So I was looking at, at that movement and the contrast with the quietness of the court. <clears throat> and in a moment, I saw passing a yellow bus that closed the door completely and was a, a moment of intensity because it was not already the movement of people, but the, the, the yellow covering completely the door, and then it started. Then I thought I should paint it and I made it in, in yellow. And okay, I went there in the end uh, to assist the put up of the, the three elements. So, and this is and the, a, and the image on the left. Huh? The image on the left, the sculptures. Um, is that something that to, you can continue to do in parallel with your work in the office? Do you do you produce sculptures um, yourself or only when you're asked to? No, this is where during some uh, ten years, perhaps. My work was in China and Taiwan, Taiwan and Korea, happily, because in, in Portugal, I did not have work enough to maintain the, the office. So during these years, I had together with a younger architect, Castanheira, that uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we went many times to China. We worked, we made all the projects in Porto, but would go and be there 10 days to, to visit his different contact, the owners and, and 
speak with the, the workers and technicians, engineers were from just from the country, no local engineers. And it was uh, fantastic because there, in, in contrast with uh, what I could see in Portugal, and uh, not only in Portugal, there, there, there was real enthusiasm. The wish of quality in architecture. So also they, they treated us very well. I was also not so used to, to this. I mean, very good hotels, whiskey, massage, everything at all. So good. And happily, coronavirus stopped with that. And the, those people also asked me something that not in use already in Europe or in America. Uh, they asked us to design the furniture. So on all the buildings we made there, I could put the furniture I had already designed or design new one. And they asked us sculpture or me that sculptures. Uh, and they asked me panels in azulejo, ceramic, uh, that they had seen in Portugal. Sometime, many times they came to Portugal and uh, visited my works and contacted and discussed. And also the engineers sometimes came to to Portugal to work. But we went there many times. And uh, now Castanheira, that is a young architect, uh, he goes there many times. Young, not so young, but for me, very young. Uh, and he worked the first time with me in Holland when I had some work to do in Holland. And uh, then in Lisbon, in the recuperation of Chiago, you know. And uh, when I had invitation for China, I asked him to come with me, but so we did. But now coronavirus stopped things. And, and what what is it that you find in those sculptures that, um that you don't in architecture. Uh, um, is there um, is there a, a greater sense of um, freedom? I mean, in your sculptures, there is a constant presence of the human body. In in a way, architecture and uh, maybe it's time more. Even if I notice that it's changing, but not exactly in direction I would like. Uh, because in York became very slow to design a building it to make it up if it goes up takes so much time that uh, it's, it's difficult it's painful and uh, that was the reason why I began making furniture because furniture you design something can use difficult to design a, a chair, but when you arrive to design one, you ask prototype and it comes and immediately we can correct things. And so, so while we are working with prototypes as the designers of motor cars, they have prototypes. In architecture, it's very difficult and it's time more difficult also to have some fragments, but I know, I remember to see Venturi elements, prototypes in, in one, one scale, but that is becoming each time more difficult to, to get. So, the more interesting for me in, in sculpture is that I can see it, does not take years. Last buildings I could make in Portugal is 20 years, 
15 years, not less than it, then there is the exigencies and so, but also the, the levels. Faltered the financement. So you have to wait for finance, financement. Uh, sometimes there is each year or so European financement, but there is many people fighting to be contemplated with that financement. So this year we don't have the owner does not get help to make this. And uh, together I began assisting to less interest for architecture. In a way, architecture, at least in Portugal and in some European countries I worked where, is considered a, as an elitist activity and also expensive and not needed. It's a, a incredible as the, the success of what we call modern architecture in the 30s and then in the 50s, but mainly in the 30s, 40s, I think, was the work in social programs, economic architecture, bringing quality to that and bringing architecture to everybody, not only to rich people. So those programs are now not going so well. And uh, was created this idea, and even in a way that uh, architects are two people that come to look to the work in course and create uh, difficulties and so uh, and expensive with a, a built vision that has no correspondence to reality, but is important. So now coronavirus gave another coup in, in architecture. So it's a, a very bad time for architecture, at least according let's, to the broken experiment. I hope it's not general. Let's stop your, let's stop your pessimism. Um, <laughs> And, and, and become a little bit more optimistic. Um, <laughs> and these sketches, I mean, the, when we go through your um, piles and piles of sketchbooks, um, you have always described your work as a, as a result of a collective effort with partners and colleagues and engineers and consultants and clients. Uh, but despite that collective effort, which you know you find in parts very frustrating, um, there is still a highly intimate and highly personal experience within each project. Uh, and so that that is that in that intimacy of the project is there where you find, I suppose, optimism, sense of freedom, and where you take the risks. So architecture, to a point, I was going to ask you like music, like poetry, like other arts, is still an intimate, private process. Architecture. No, no, I, 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 I work with a team and uh, I cannot dispense that. I, I do not uh, work alone, and uh, also, and that is my fault. Today, as everything must be in the computer, even to 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 put the the projects for approval of approval, we are obliged to make it in informatic, and. Uh, of course, I informed the computer was a big event, the appearance of the computer. 
to, to architecture, uh, the increasing and the uh, quickness of information and the, how the, all the, the consults we have to do during a research, how it comes. And in, in, in some things is very quick also. But in, in other things is slow. Uh, for someone that is using in a, a part of the research, in a phase of the research, to make sketches, one sketch you make in one second, and you make, and then you say, no, this is good for nothing, and put out. Uh, and this is seconds. But in computer, uh, and for that reason, I did not um, like to work with computer. In fact, I am an alphabet in that. Uh, it was my fault, I regret today. But one of the reasons was that slowness when testing, thinking, looking for alternatives, comparing, and then leave it, and perhaps later to take it again. So this dynamic of the the project with computer, you arrive. So I, I use even today to sit side by side with the collaborator and give some instructions and look and it will tell me this or that. And uh, I suggest this and makes the experiment. But in the, this phase, what I see is that he has to touch uh, button and then comes maceta, my, an arrow. An arrow. <laughs> and I have to wait. And the collaborator says it's heavy. <laughs> okay, and then if finally comes the image. Uh, again to make some experience. You have to wait again, the arrow and then the, the heavy effect. And so, so there is a phase where I, I get nervous with that because I am used to. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, should we should we dedicate the last few minutes to to something else, which is um, how do you how what do you read in 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 the words that are written about your work and um, the one on the left uh, was uh, an article that uh, many of us know very well by Pedro Vieira de Almeida written in 1967 mm -hmm. to which um, if I remember well well not in that time because I'm a little bit younger you replied. Um, you replied to the author of this essay, uh, and what I wanted to ask you was, uh, do you learn from these words that are written about your work? Are they useful? Yes, of course, I learn. Yeah. I discover things that, uh, because when we don't, when we build, we don't do only we are conscious, conscious of. And uh, sometimes we have surprise with a critic that uh, explains as this has this origin. And we can say, oh, okay, yes, it's true. Uh, I have a story when I was in, in Berlin, walking in Berlin with the architect that worked with me there. And I saw in, in the back of one of these big blocks of Berlin, six floors, I saw a form that, that was very near the corner of the building I met there, you know, the curved corner. And I told him, someone is making a copy of my building. And he left them. Because what I was looking, I saw a grua, or yeah, yeah, uh, a crane working in this form, so similar. If someone copy was you, 
because what you are looking is the destruction, demolition of a building. They say, oh, now that was near my building. And so until today, I have this doubt if I had or not seen this building. But it was so near to form that, in my opinion, I saw the building, but I did not notice it appointed. But my eyes kept it, and it comes very quick back. So I, I, I admit it was an influence direct from that building. And the learning in architecture is to have so many of this, even not know it, but strong impressions that become engraved, engraved in our mind. They are here and they are used when the opportunity comes. And um, I mean, and, and what what did it mean? So that that article was 1967. Then there was Gregotti in the early 1970s which became the beginning of a very long standing relationship between you and Italy. And then in the 1980s, um, we have uh, Kenneth Frampton on the right, which um, uh, reflects on two or three of your projects as an argument for the architecture of resistance in the critical regionalism. And then on the left, we have Peter Testa, um, one or two years later, um, trying to argue against the idea of regionalism in your work and saying that your work is not regionalist at all. So here are two, um, I wouldn't say conflicting, they, when you read Peter Testa, it appears like a deliberate conflict with Kenneth Frampton, but here are two complementary views of your work. Um, what did it mean to you to read critical regionalism in 1983? No, uh, the work of uh, Kenneth Frampton is uh, open, universal consideration of uh, cultural activity, arch architecture, mainly in all the world. Uh, he, he was, in, in some cases, the first to bring light for the activity in countries that were considered these years ago, you no know, periphery. So in, in architecture, there was some centers of culture, few, Milano, London, uh, New York in a moment, Paris, this was the culture, this was the center of architecture. The rest was periphery. Or Alt was a peripheric. And the, the work of Franklin was uh, around the world, were walking around the world to take this and this and this and this, putting it in light and make a critic and description. So we enriched strongly the how did the, the language of architecture and the proof that in architecture we cannot speak uh, in a way in some way yes we cannot speak of center of periphery because architecture existed and exists everywhere. And sometimes we, we discover things that we can not, uh, could not imagine, as Alvaralto. Alvaralto was not so well known uh, in the beginning of his activity, uh, but even was uh, accused that was the term in the mind, the, mind then of a neoclassic. And in fact, he became uh, transported by neoclassic architecture, Nordic. There is a famous book of uh, Frampton, Frampton, exactly Nordic neoclassicism. So now he, he, he was, in a way, unhappy 
to use the, the, the word uh, regionalist. Regionalist became um, a word maladeta, modi. Mm? And uh, people, some people, speak about the, the work of Frampton as uh, the opposite of universal. And it is exactly universal because it is not a fixation in the, in the closeness of regions. On the opposite is in the openness, uh, bringing to light what was considered nothing in some ways. It's... Um, in 1992, you wrote a very nice note as a tribute to James Sterling, which I think it would be nice to finish in James Sterling because, you know, this event um, is organized in Britain, so um, a connection to uh, England. And you wrote that uh, the masterpiece that is the Cambridge History fac Faculty opens all the postmodern paths and closes any conception of postmodernism as an opposition or denial of modernism. This message took time to be understood, here constructed in total authenticity. During this time, the work of Sterling went through the paths of freedom, continuity, anchored in a world made of change. Um, I, that I wrote, yes, this, this. You, you did. I'm afraid you did. This is this is your words. <laughs> These are your words. Thank um, you. Remember me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so the, the, um, how, how influential? Because I mean, Sterling was a little bit older than you. Uh, I think he's Fernando Tavora's generation. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there is a period in the 1960s that you are all looking at the same things. You are all looking at um, Alvar Aalto, you are all looking at um, Robert Venturi. Uh, and, then, and then there is this building, which I think uh, many people have um, related as, as an influence in your work at the time. Uh, can you describe your admiration and what you learned from the work of uh, James Sterling? Oh, Sterling. Well, about this building, the library in Cambridge, uh, I went with um, some friends and uh, the wives of my friend, my own wife, to pass one week in London. It was very good. Mm -hmm. And one of the days we went to Cambridge. I had never been in, in Cambridge. In London, I think I had already been but a few days. And we visited the library. Now Cambridge, oh, marvelous, oh, marvelous ambience. But when I arrived to the library, we entered. And uh, I was, I, f I felt happy. Mm. I felt happy with the, the way he enlarges space up and down also, but that gives that profile. So space is never finished. You don't see how it fits, goes, goes, goes. And then that is reflected in the exterior. And also one thing I liked much is how this architect uh, in his buildings in that time used the um, handicraft work and the recuperation of all design. For instance, I remember that the next dish the lampers almost ascending the lampers. Ah, the switch. Yeah. And Bauhaus drawing and many parts of building uh, very much handicraft work. So with that density 
of, of what means working the object directly, the material directly. And it was, it impressed me very much. And the building you, you presented, my building, the bank, this one. Uh, when I arrived to Portugal from those days, holiday days, I had to begin working for this building, a command of a bank agency, small bank agency. And uh, what, what I brought in my mind so strong was this space going up and back and so on. The first sketches which we have now, even they are not near, but they have much single deli delicate uh, work of language he used with uh, aluminium windows, very light and so on and so on. Uh, but I went on. I, after come, coming from London, I visited the first time the place. And in place, looking around, I saw uh, all the house. And in the back, you see this curve. This curve, I made it to bring light to the building, which is in the back, which is a 18th century building. And the owner uh, becoming poor, Hidalgo, Hidalgo, no se Hidalgo, began, uh, began uh, selling pieces of the, the garden. So even the bank was in the garden of the, that uh, 18th century house. And I was very troubled when I saw that we were taking the light from the rest of the, the garden that is still had and the veranda of the building and so. And that was the reason that I began making this curve. Also, I must say, I lost, I, is it here? I must say that uh, uh, this different setback, that getting back of the volume of building has to see with stumbling building. The language completely changed when I went to the site and I saw the old house in Stupo White. Uh, in front, there was a market, small market with a patio, another patio, made by the professor I mentioned that was director in faculty, the one that made me see that I was an ignorant simply. And in the other corner, in front of this, the, the, the building is curved. And they all are rather massive. And so the architecture changed completely. But uh, the first idea for the organization of space is a result of the big impression I had uh, visiting the, the library of Sterling. Thank you very much. Um, that that was the last image. Alice, do you want to um, open the floor to any questions? Yes, there are questions now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> it's getting light. Difficult questions. I, um, I feel Caesar's been so generous uh, with his time, but um, I mean, if there are uh, there's a couple that have appeared, uh, Bruno, if you see in the chat box, um, if there are any uh, you think you'd like to pitch. Yeah, um, We have one um, from Lauren Henkin. Um, how does experiencing the completed buildings vary from how you imagined them in drawings and models? 
Could you, re could you repeat the, the question? Yeah, of course. Um, the question was, how does the experience of your completed buildings vary from your, how you imagined them in drawings and models? Como é que o edifício acabado varia das maquetes e dos modelos? Quer dizer, qual é a diferença da maquete para o edifício? O que é que acontece? Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, the models change. We, we begin usually with a small site model and a, a small scale, the volumes, and then we have to go on. Uh, making bigger models, uh, some with the, the interiors to study well the space, the ceilings and so. I remember in one of the museums in China, in the office, uh, the collaborators made a big model where I could enter in a chair with it. <laughs> To, to see the, the space completely. So also changes are made in during well, the project, the, the uh, thinking about the detail, the materials, the money it costs that may possible or not. So a transformation goes through the, all the project. And then, uh, at the same time, we look for buildings where there is something that we can use and you, you, we want not copy, but see the effect re really, be conscient of the effect. Sometimes we change because of that. Sometimes we say, okay, it's going in the, in the, right, uh, in the right way. Uh, and when I began working, it was much more uh, enthusiastic, the, the thing, the architecture, making architecture, because, uh, also because I was young, <laughs> but also because I could enter the building in construction and uh, discover that it would be better if we change that there. Because there is no experience as visiting the space. Even big models, it's not the same. So we discover other things. And then the builder would say, but that costs more. And I could say, no problem. I'm not so interested in that. You take that and the money goes to make that. So, uh, this was the ambience in execution of a, of a project, uh, which today is completely finished. Even the tendency and the reality is that after making the executive drawings and uh, giving the, for the builders to give the price and for approval and so, we cannot change no, nothing. Because there is a, a new personality called the, the gestion, gesture of the, the building, the gesture of the construction. And uh, we say, oh, I like to make this. And say, no, no change. And uh, we speak with the owner eventually and we say, it was much better and the owner is no, no, no change. So this is completely different ambience today. And uh, it's not accompanied by the intensity of prototypes in general, in most of the buildings. Some buildings, uh, an architect important can get it, but in general, no. So one of the problems I see with the evolution uh, in architecture is the, the fact that uh, the process of thinking a project, and for that, your question is very good. Finish before the construction. It's like, like it's only the drawing and the, the study and the proving. Then the rest, bye bye, architect. You are a, a trouble here. So, but 
but I recognize that the evolution in everything today is very difficult, it does not happen. Uh, because everything is canalized, conducted to these restrictions, uh, borders, specializations, and so everything is cut. So architecture is inside this revolution, cannot be outside, is impossible. But uh, I hope, and today, with the fear of Korish or of um, COVID, 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 COVID uh, many people are speaking of everything has to be transformed. The life arrived to uh, impasse. And so this is the opportunity for a new period of development of human time mind and spirituality and so it's a, a very good and generous idea but for me it it will not happen because when the epidemic is finished everything comes up again i don't see that the it, 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 it's a tendency for fundamental changes that is connected with fear and not to, uh, I think, to real wish and solidarity for it. Um, thank you. I have, a, I have another question here from a, a friend, my friend Fabrizio Forti, that is watching us from Sicily and is asking you about your um, experience in the post-earthquake reconstruction program uh, with, with the Italian friends in Sicily uh, for Gibellina, Salemi and the Cusa quarries um, in the west side of um, Sicily. What was, the, what was the value of that experience to you? For Salemi, for you. Uh, was specifically that the post remote in Sicilia and what the process was, the experience. 15 fantastic days. It was workshops for students, and there was one that uh, a professor that directed small groups. There were a lot of some new friends and some old friends uh, were they Italians and not only Italians. And I had a group and I took with me the young Sotomora that was still finishing the course but worked as assistant. <coughs> and Kolova uh, uh, <coughs> that I had known not much time ago, is from, from Sicily. And uh, we were uh, charged to make a study for Salem, for this town destroyed by earthquake, with the underground area not destroyed, uh, with uh, a new already put inside, a new area with prefabricated barracks, barracks put on a phenomenon and sickness, uh, um, a slab of cement and then barracks, 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 barracks. So it happened, the context was that the people in the, living in the town did not like at all, <laughs> normally, abnormal, the barracks. They wanted to go back to the old town, recuperated. They hated the barracks. So we made a study exactly considering the possibilities of putting up again the, the, the town. And there were old people there that explained us, not architects, uh, habitants, 
that uh, the underground area with the faults had not fallen, had resisted because it was flexible. So they, they said, no, we have the base very well and we can go on. And we made a plan uh, <clears throat> who was received by, by the mayor that later uh, charged us to do in the center of the town recuperation of the uh, old church, the big church, even, and the space around and what to do there. So we are contracted and we made the, the maintaining the ruins of the church transformed in an area outside area for different activities for a mess also. And then we worked in streets, all those streets. But in a moment, the, the, the mayor was put out. And uh, as they told us, he was suspected or accused of belonging to mafia. And that area in Italy is very complicated, was put out. And the next one, uh, probably did not belong to mafia, but also didn't like the architecture. What the, the, the program finished. Uh, what I learned, uh, the, the, the way to procurar, search. to search in the ruins, in topography, uh, in something that became, well, resisted. Uh, but in many fragments, disconnected by the earth break, like uh, the work of a detective, the architect is in a way a detective, looking for it and uh, think of, of how to connect, to give sense to all these fragments and so on. And that is a, a way not only to remake what was, but to find a, a way to make it habitable, livable. livable, that town. And it's at the same time something I, I had exper experienced in, in Porto after the 25 April that context of revolution is how speaking with people can be also material for the design for architecture, not asking that they say yes how to do and saying yes by respect for the people. It, it, you, happened many times unhappily, but discussing with them and discovering that from the beginning to discuss how the kitchen must be related to the living room or something like that, discussing, arriving to discuss the town, because that was what happened in Porto. Again, we all thought that we are discussing small things, but with the, the, the intensity of this moment and the, 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 the big contradiction in the, in the situation uh, without a relative void of power and so, it was very intense and authentic. And sometimes with conflicts even, and then, we saw that with these people without no education, we arrived to speak about the town, not about the thing. And I, I had some experience in the Salemi, less intense because there was no revolution and because time was not so, so, so much. But uh, the, the experience of e 
evidently the discussion with the contact authentic, not politically opportunist with these people is material for the, the project for the architecture. And I had uh, experimented this uh, also in later, little later in Holland, in Den Haag, and was invited for a neighborhood with uh, problems by the presence of immigrants and the reaction of population to it. One seems so present today that already in the 80s I could find in Berlin and in Den Haag in Holland. Uh, so it was also very intense. And, uh, and, uh, I learned with that. More? <laughs> one hour passed already. <laughs> <laughs> one hour. One hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs>